Our scripture passage this morning comes from the first book of 1 Corinthians, the first chapter, verses 10 through 18. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, by the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you be in agreement and that there be no divisions among you, but that you be united in the same mind and the same purpose. For it has been reported to me by Chloe's people that there are quarrels among you, my brothers and sisters. What I mean is that each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Has Christ been divided? Was Paul crucified for you? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one can say that you were baptized in my name. And then I add parenthetically, I did baptize also the household of Stephanus. Beyond that, I do not know whether I baptized anyone else. Some of you get it. <laughs> For Christ did not send me to baptize, but to proclaim the gospel, and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Now I have an admission to make. I really did not want to preach from this New Testament passage today. It was one of the lectionary passages. My preference was really to take time exegeting, meditating on, studying, and writing a sermon based on one of the other passages um, in the lectionary today. I was especially drawn to the psalm message which Sarah read earlier. It's a message of reassurance the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the stronghold of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? I also gave a lot of thought to and considered preaching from the Matthew passage that illustrated Jesus' call of his disciples. That passage would have suited me well too. But this Corinthians passage, whew, it literally would not leave me alone. Reading Paul's letter to the Corinthians is the same as us taking the liberty of opening and reading the mail or co correspondence addressed to someone else. Originally written to the small group of people in the ancient Mediterranean city of Corinth, surely Paul's letter couldn't possibly speak into our current day or circumstances. Or could it? Commentator Richard May speculates, no doubt the Corinthian Christians of Paul's day would have preferred that this correspondence not be broadcast to the ages, for it portrays them in an unflattering light and divulges a number of things that they might well, with the wisdom of hindsight, wish to have kept private." End of quote. However, thanks be to God, Paul's letter is part of the New Testament canon, was circulated widely, gives us a glimpse into one of the early Christian churches and some of the issues that plague them, unfortunately, plague us today. After his salutation, Paul expresses thankfulness for all that God has done for the Corinthians in the past and his hope for God's continued work among them in the future writing. I give thanks to God for the church in Corinth because of the grace of God that has been given in Jesus Christ. For in every way you have been enriched in him, in speech and knowledge of every kind. Just as the testimony of Christ has been strengthened among you so that you are not lacking in any spiritual gift as you wait for the revealing of our Lord Jesus Christ. Apparently, Paul addresses his siblings by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, and he continues to write, may they all agree that there be no divisions among them and that they be united in the same mind and the same purpose. 
Then Paul shares that Chloe's people had reported that there was quarreling among them. A woman's people actually had the audacity to give a negative report to Paul about the church that he had established. Now, can we take a moment um, to talk a little bit about Chloe? Although we don't know a lot about her, the description Chloe's people designates that she was the head of a household and possibly a house church that included biological relatives, enslaved as well as freed people. And Chloe must have been respected by and in good standing with Paul to be considered a credible source and witness to the issues in the Corinthian church and for her people to be comfortable enough to boldly transmit this message to Paul. Ashley Wilcox comments, what in other circumstances might be considered gossip is in this case, the impetus for a letter from Paul to the church, end of quote. In other words, Paul believed a woman. He did not discredit her perception of what was occurring he did not question her veracity. He did not challenge her integrity. He did not disqualify her interpretation, nor did Paul seek to silence her voice. Paul received the report from Chloe's people and Paul believed her. You might say that Paul embodied the biblical version of believe the women. Amen. Amen. The Corinthian church was a diverse and lively community. It experienced social tensions based on economic power, differing social status and education. It was those tensions that precipitated the, what I call the Corinthian conundrum, divisions and quarreling, the mistreatment of people who were economically insufficient and dismissing people who were not as learned as others. This all boiled, boiled down to a lack of unity among the people. James Thompson writes, the emphasis on individual freedom at the expense of the community and the disregard of the rich for the poor lies beneath the many issues that confronted the Corinthian church. At the heart of the problems at Corinth is the fact that members are puffed up and against each other. My Lord. The Corinthians also had strong convictions. These are my words. They were egotistical and antagonistic and loyal to particular leaders. Paul made that observation when he wrote, each of you says, I belong to Paul, or I belong to Apollos, or I belong to Cephas, or I belong to Christ. Commentator Thompson suggests that the Corinthian factions were created by those who claimed that the rhetorical power of their teacher was a demonstration of their wisdom. Obviously, the phenomena of identifying with and being drawn to particular leaders inside the church and society at large based on their wisdom, their personality, their charisma or gravitas, their rhetor rhetorical prowess or their God-given gifts is not new. But today, people have taken doing so to a whole new level, both inside and outside outside of the church. Now, I'm not talking about or denigrating anyone or any particular church. Please know that it is not my intent to discourage anyone from loving their pastor. As a matter of fact, I pray <laughs> daily that you all love your pastors. However, when we find it hard or difficult to accept others, when we worship the messenger more than the message, we're in trouble. We are idolizing the person and placing them, in some cases, above God or the will of God. The Corinthians had lost their way. They are confused. Their inclination to claim that they belong to certain church leaders caused divisions. Their desire to achieve a status worthy of self-acclamation and their boasting had caused them to lose sight of their true identity, their foundational belonging, namely that they belonged to Christ and to him alone. 
because they belong to Christ, all partisanship, whether to Paul, to Apollos, to Cephas, or any other human leader or group was inappropriate. Doing so denies the sovereignty and the primacy of God, the God of their and our salvation. Paul finds the Corinthian conundrum scandalous and untenable, so he poses a series of rhetorical questions that can only be answered negatively. Paul wasn't crucified for you, was he? You weren't baptized in the name of Paul, were you? Paul makes the point that no human pastor, preacher, nor leader can or should ever be the foundation of the church's faith, function, or unity. In the words of the old hymn, our hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. On Christ, the solid rock, we stand. All other ground is sinking sand. All other ground is sinking sand. Paul continues, has Christ been divided? Richard Hayes suggests that the community's dissension has created an absurd situation. Christ is being treated as a commodity or a possession to be haggled over. Thus, the one body of Christ has been fragmented into interest groups. End of quote. I pray that we have not commodified or placed greater value on any individual or aspect of our worshiping community than, uh, than another. To do so is an affront to God. It is destructive, and it certainly does not support what we know to be the gospel truth, that we are all precious, valued, integral to, and loved members of the family of God. Appealing to his Corinthian siblings in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, Paul admonishes them to agree not to be divided, but united in the same mind and the same purpose or opinion. Paul implores the recipients of his letter to stop or overcome their quarreling and their commitment that undermines their unity. Now, lest we get it twisted, standing in unity does not connote uniformity. It doesn't mean that we are not distinctive, wonderful, and amazing individuals, much like the snowflakes Miss Sarah had up here and we're expecting later this afternoon. Paul acknowledged that there is great diversity in the Corinthian church. The members of the body of Christ include the educated and the uneducated, the rich and the poor, Jews and Gentiles, slave and free, and male or female. And diversity is also denoted in and inclusive of our various gifts, talents, and functions, all of which are gifted and given by God and necessary for the benefit of the whole. In the words of Paul, the eye cannot say to the hand, I have no need of you, nor the head to the feet, I have no need of you. Thanking God that he did not baptize any of them except for the few he finally conceded that he did baptize. Paul continues, Christ did not send me to baptize but to proclaim the gospel and not with eloquent wisdom, so that the cross of Christ might not be emptied of its power. For the message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. Doug Hume writes, Paul grounds the Corinthians' unity in the power of the cross of Christ. And his point is that Jesus' undeserved capital punishment has the power to transform a broken and fractionalized little church into a community that has a shared transformative purpose. Times of transition and change, when entered to, into in peace and cohesiveness, when entered into joyfully expecting what God is doing and will do next, when entered into acknowledging that what was, acknowledging what was and looking forward to what is ahead can be transformative. It can be enriching, vivifying, and most of all, it can be unifying. The Corinthians worshiping community's unity and ours is entirely dependent on Jesus' death on the cross. 
The church body is saved and sustained by the sacrificial death, burial, resurrection, and ascension of, and only in the name of Jesus. When the people of God keep this truth in focus, petty rivalries and preferences for particular leaders are revealed in their true light as being totally unproductive. The cause of division and dissension and result in stymieing the church's growth and certainly cause unnecessary distractions. As people who belong to Christ, our business is to follow the example and to go out into the highways and byways and compel people to come. Christ commanded, make disciples and that we love one another. To live in such a way before the world, people who walk in darkness, people who have lost all their hope, people who do not know which direction to turn in next, can and they will see the light of God shining through us. And they will be drawn and compelled to desire that same assuring, healing, providing, and loving light to shine in their lives as well. In Paul's letter to the Corinthian church, his primary concern is restoring them to unity, to reinforce the realization that they belong to Christ, not to any other individual, and that everything that unites us, the grace of God, the love of Christ, the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, and the foolish, unconventional message of the cross is the power of God, and more formidable and comprehensive than anything that can ever separate or divide us. For just as Paul asked the Romans, who can separate us from the love of Christ? Will hardship or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or peril or sword? It is written, for your sake we are being killed all day long. We are accounted as sheep to be slaughtered. No, Paul says, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am convinced and we must be convinced that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor heights, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord and will, should not be able to separate us from one another. And in the comforting and assuring words of the psalmist, you know, that message that I would have preferred to preach. <laughs> the Lord is our light and our salvation. Whom shall we fear? The Lord is the stronghold of our lives. Of whom shall we be afraid? Beloved, Let's not get caught up in the Corinthian conundrum. Amen. 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 Amen.